Orchestra. What if you could own the virtual world? Create, develop, and trade without limits. Make genuine connections and earn real money. Decentraland, a fully immersive platform powered by the blockchain. Buy land. Well, just before six, we told you about this. A virtual world called, as that gentleman said there, Decentraland. Investors are spending real money. They're spending quite a lot of it to buy and develop land in a new city that only exists online. Yes, uh, if it sounds like the stuff of science fiction, then it is. Have you seen the film Ready Player One? A whole virtual universe. People come to the Oasis for all the things they can do. But they stay because of all the things they can be. Uh, I've not seen the film. Great book, by the way, Ready Player One. It's about people who are dissatisfied with their life on Earth and live pretty miserable existences and then go and invent a whole new world where they do spend money. Well, thousands of dollars worth of a digital cryptocurrency are being spent on the chance to create a new virtual life in decentral land. And maybe, and this is quite interesting because I've just been on the website and it does make a point of this, monetizing your investment, making a profit. You can build whatever you want on the plots of virtual land. At auction, people paid more than £20 million for their parcels of land, making it the largest ever sale of its kind, with the most expensive plot costing 180 grand. Yeah. Plots are being resold for six-figure sums. Purchases are made in a cryptocurrency called MANA. So will Decentraland and other worlds like it be the birth of a new virtual economy or a cryptocurrency property bubble? Easy for some to say. And how much of our lives are we going to be living online in the near future? Well, to discuss all of this, we have Jonathan Griffin from BBC Trending. Hello, Jonathan. Hello. We have James Ashton as well, who's setting up a university in Decentraland. Hello, James. Uh, hello. Uh, hello. Hi. And we have David Gerrard as well, whose book, Attack of the 50-Foot Blockchain, which sounds so threatening. It's all about the digital and online currencies. We have him as well. Hi, David. Hello. Um, Jonathan, could we start with you? Because just to set the scene for us, this is a world that doesn't exist apart from online and yet people are spending real money, hard currency that I have in my purse right now on it. Why? Well, I think the brutal fact is because people think that this is an investment. People think that this is going to bring in big bucks over time. And of course, we don't know at this stage if that's going to be the case or if it's not. But what they're buying into is a social platform in a way because it's a, a kind of forum for people to go online with a VR headset or perhaps via a desktop computer and to hang around. What they're doing on that platform, what they're saying in those conversations, what they're saying in the virtual universities and stood around the popcorn machine at a virtual fairground, whatever it may be, that's where they think the money's going to come in. But for a stake in that, they're willing to put down some money now for a parcel of land, and then they can develop that land into whatever they choose. OK, so I go and buy my parcel of land with real money or fake money? Well, you're going to buy it via a cryptocurrency, and it's going to cost you quite a sum. OK, so if you're interested in doing this, this is going to cost you, realistically at least hundreds of dollars. But as you mentioned before, the top ones, those those big prime kind of real estate areas are going to cost you thousands and thousands of dollars. Okay, because I'm just trying to get my mind around this and I'm just thinking if you're on Facebook and, and you bought, say, a birthday cake icon for a friend, in effect, you have done that. You have paid real money for something that only exists in the virtual world. So I'm yeah. just extending that. Okay, so. so it's extending that, but this time you're going to buy a parcel of land, 10 metres by 10 metres or whatever it is, and in that patch of land, you can create whatever you can imagine. Okay, I'm building a bar. And yeah, I'm building no this problem. bar and I'm going to charge you to come into this bar because it's the best bar you've ever imagined with the best beer ever. Are you going to pay me in real money or are you paying me in cryptocurrency? We're back to the cryptocurrency again. Look, you're going to notice that that keeps perforating our conversations. It's going to be really hard for you to get away from that. And ultimately, if it was incredibly successful, I guess there might be a way. But broadly speaking, this is going to come back to cryptocurrency and you're going to put real money at stake, but you're going to do it through this system of payment. Let's bring in James. And James Ashton, you are doing this because you're you're setting up a university. 
Well, yes. So the project is basically a, a bunch of, of uh, people sort of contributed the uh, lands uh, to this in the hope of a project where they could be sort of free to uh, teach, you know, create educational uh, ventures and, and also to, to learn themselves. So uh, so there's, there's quite a following of people. There's about, I think, about 180 uh, people sort of got involved and decided to uh, contribute to make this happen. Uh, James, I mean, what, what in, in reality, oh, God, I, I shouldn't use that phrase, that's just popped out, but I suppose in virtual reality, you could just set up a website. What is the difference? What, why do we need to go to Decentraland to join your virtual university? Well, I think, obviously, one of the things is that uh, Decentraland itself is like a platform, which means it's a set of standards which will enable the kind of concept of the virtual world to evolve and to allow other players to, to sort of uh, come in and and, and uh, right. uh, build their own solutions around it, just in the same way that that has happened with the World Wide Web. So that's a platform, then. It's a meeting point. So it's, it's getting bums on seats. Every, everyone will go to Decentraland, and you, and you hope to, to make the most of that. Are you going to be trying to monetize your university, James? Well, I think it's a, it's, it's a hybrid sort of uh, model in that we have about 25 sort of uh, projects currently defined, you know, things like the School of English or the School of Architecture, and this is where, like, individuals have decided to sort of champion that facility. And uh, so some of those are going to probably want to uh, monetize. Like, so, for example, the School of English might decide to to uh, do some sort of uh, TEFL education or whatever. So that would yeah. be a definite sort of a line of monetization. But there's also the, the whole idea behind it is to sort of uh, uh, balance the sort of commercial side with the academic side so that things which aren't right. necessarily going to be like uh, financially sort of lucrative have a chance to exist so so it sounds as though there's already some kind of if not political code some kind of moral code that exists in decentraland if you take uh, again i'll mention it again ready player one which i found very interesting concept as a book what people were doing in that um and forgive forgive me if neither of you or none of you have seen it but but essentially people had different worlds to choose so you might invest in decentraland james but then somebody else might say no i want to be a bit more radical a bit more lawless i'm going to invent another world and and get more bums on seats and your investment would might might in the end be irrelevant well that's uh, true, but on the other hand, uh, like uh, those of us in this space have got a full uh, view of what's going on because it's like any other industry. The the, the uh, people into it are are you know they've got an, an awareness of what the alternatives are, and uh, uh, Decentraland looks to me like the most likely sort of a candidate of all the things I've evaluated. So that's where I've put you know uh, most of my effort and energies. Okay. Okay. So say there's not another world that somebody's creating, but there could be another university. Tony might just think right now, you know what? I've always wanted to set up an equivalent of Oxford University. Decentraland is going to be the place I'm going to do it. And he wipes yours off the entrance. You, nobody wants to come and join your university anymore. What do you do then? Well, it's going to, that's, you see, that's the thing, because this is the blockchain. And actually, we've already got the, a very uh, prominent position in Decentraland. Like, uh, we own the land. We would have to choose to sell that. And for another university to exist... Uh, yes, yes. Someone would have to, of the scale we can do, someone would have to assemble about fifteen hundred land parcels, which that will cost them a good deal of of, of uh, money to do, and even to get those as contiguous parcels in 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 world will be almost impossible. So, from that perspective, we have got the. The, the sort of you've wiped out the competition. Yeah. <laughs> I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that because you could easily have a decentralised approach, and you could have a brand of learning, and you could invest in on a on a case by case basis and build things up. I'm not what, saying that what, that at all. But what I find really ironic about this conversation, James, is that is that on the real world, uh, um, um, clicks is beating bricks hands down. But you're going you're going to virtual reality world and claiming that you've got the biggest building. <laughs> which, which is a kind of Ill, Ill, illogical touch to it. David Gerrard's here. Hello, David. Hello. Now, I'm told you're investing as well, so can I, what's your involvement in all this? What, what do you make of, of Decentraland? I am definitely not investing oh, okay. in it. okay, all right. Um, I mean, basically, we've done all this before. It's Second Life from 10 years ago. Someone's just said that on the text console, Mark in Bexhill. Yeah. yeah, Second Life. It's the obvious comparison. Yeah, I mean, so go on, tell us about Second Life then and compare I mean, Second it. Life was the huge fashionable thing, you know. Everyone was going to go into the virtual world and we were, they were going to set up universities, they were going to have corporate presence there, government presence there and everything because it was the first sort of 
virtual reality shared world game because PCs had advanced to the point where you could render that stuff at home pretty well on a normal PC. Mm. So it was really exciting because the technology could finally make it real. But then it went out of fashion because the next thing came along and um, Second Life still exists. It's alive and well as a game and people still play it and go on to it, but it's not the hugely fashionable thing that's going to revolutionise the world. Um, so we've done this before. So with Decentraland, I think the big question for Decentraland is no one wants to mess around with cryptocurrency. I mean, it's just a pain in the backside in every regard. So you're going to buy one currency so that you can buy another currency so that you can buy things in Decentraland. So I can't see that really doing hugely well for them unless it's really a good game to play, right? Well, well If it attracts people who don't give a hoot about blockchains, who don't give a hoot about cryptocurrency, if it's actually a good game and takes the lessons of... Second life, maybe it can succeed, but that's they've set up barriers for themselves there. But but in essence, it's pretty harmless, isn't it? It's, it's like-minded, oh, it's game, like-minded yeah. people doing like-minded things, but spending hard currency or, or, totally. or cryptocurrency. Absolutely. I mean, it's it it will live or live or die or fall into irrelevance on its quality as a game to play. And 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 this idea then of virtual reality headsets, for example, I quite like the idea of going home. Uh, after a hard day at work and sitting in my living room and and thinking, right, I, I'm I'm off to the to some exotic seaside location where James Ashton may have opened a five star luxury hotel and I can go and have a prawn sandwich. Uh, that 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 in theory sounds quite appealing, but is does the technology exist for me to do that? Um, it, the technology exists to show put that in front of your eyes, and if you're one of an unlucky ten or twenty percent, you'll get a pounding headache within about five minutes and throw up. But apart from that, if you don't, then that'll be great. Right. But you mentioned there, Tony, about the the idea of going to a seafood restaurant and to enjoy yourself and to go and socialise in these things. And that seems fine now. Let's take it forward to the future, right? Because that's what's really interesting about the Decentraland project is the idea that in the future, the guys who created this step back, take away the ideas of governance and say, hey, you're the people who bought this land. Now you're in charge. And if that happens then what will it like to be go to a restaurant? Will you be dealing with things that may not be so palatable on the way there, on the menu there? Right. Who knows? Well, if it's a free-for-all, how long before we have the first virtual war? I think the, the, well, the first thing that will happen is, again, we have to learn from history. In Second Life, what was the thing that everyone was plagued with? Sending flying body parts at people and rude things. It was amazing. It was like trolls and griefers. They are your threat model. How do you keep people from trashing your nice virtual world just because they think that's their idea of fun? Yeah. Every social medium has that. I mean, there's nothing wrong with buying stuff in the virtual world. You know, anyone who goes on the internet and pays money for something is probably doing that, you know. Um, but but this is, I wonder if, James, uh, James, if this is intriguing to you that, for example, you, you set, set up Decentraland, it seems pretty civilised, there's education and health or who knows, but then you do get those trolls coming on and threatening you digitally or otherwise, and they belong to another planet. You'd have to then, I guess, as a community, learn how to protect yourself, and that would be part of the challenge, wouldn't it? Well, I mean, all of that stuff has had a great deal of thought put into it. So there are kind of, and this is, you know, this is where, like, there's a, the line blurs between when people talk about crypto and blockchain. And actually, uh, blockchain provides one of the ideal solutions for actually uh, managing all of that type of stuff, which is I would say it does precisely the opposite. Well, hang on. Before we go any further, Jonathan, do I come to you to tell me what blockchain means or do do we ask James and David? Jonathan, I mean, can you give us a... uh... So, So basically how this works is the idea is that these parcels of land are kind of stored in a land ledger which is held by every PC who enters into the network. So that means that, in theory, this thing can't be hacked. So when it's created, nobody has a machine that holds all the data that can be attacked in one clear place by hackers. That's it- not quite true either. Oh, put me right then. Absolutely. All the data data is there on the Ethereum blockchain, which is sort of the platform that Decentraland runs on, so that all that data is there. But the Decentraland program running on top of Ethereum, a smart contract is a computer program, right? It's a, if they just abandon it to the users and say, we're not governing it anymore, it's completely free, 
what they've done is they've set up a computer program that they can't fix bugs in, which is the big problem with smart contracts. Because when did you ever hear of a computer program that had no bugs? There aren't no. any. What, what I'm, what I'm, David, I, I, I get you're cynical about this, but if, they, if all those problems could be ironed out... I'll say again to you, what is, the, what is the issue with this? It sounds like a lot of fun. It sounds like, um, you know, a great way to escape your mundane life. And, and if it can't oh, be hacked... Absolutely. If, so, so you, it was good. So you're saying if all the wrinkles can be ironed out, this, this could be potentially the future we're talking about. I don't think it'll be the future. I think it'll be a game that people might want to play. And if they don't like this one... The thing is, Decentraland has no exclusivity. Anyone could set up another copy of it. Yeah. Well, that's my point. And, you, you, and as in Ready Player One, you could set up other worlds to, to, to kind of challenge it. Jonathan, what, what, if we extrapolate from this 50 years hence, where might this kind of technology and this kind of setup lead? Do, can, do we know? Can we even imagine it? We, we, I don't think we can imagine it in its current thing. I mean, the, the important thing to notice with this one is when you look at it just visually, just the first time you put your eyes into your VR headset or perhaps you're looking at it on a desktop, actually, this is really kind of blocky. This kind of reminds you of the old-fashioned computer games. Maybe you had the, the back end of the Sega Mega Drive, the early end of the kind of PlayStation run. It's not something that's uh, particularly, uh, you know, kind of sophisticated at this stage. What that would look like in 50 years, I'm sure that would improve. But the I mean, concept of people it People play is... Minecraft, and Minecraft is made of blocks, but it's really fun to play. So, I mean, my kid loves Minecraft. Mm. Can't get her off it. But, but the idea that people want to have these conversations in virtual reality, that's going to be around for some time. Totally. It, the, all of these ideas, that they all exist in a, in a way that we can see them going on and being uh, not unique to this time. They will be here in 50 years. But whether you can actually have a sort of government that is run by the people who decide, do we want to create more land? Do we uh, change the rules in operation here to some degree? Whether you can hand all of that power over and get a result that people still want to a, go on there, B, throw hard cash at in the long run. Wow. Well, you're asking big questions. Peter right. and Bath got in touch with us here at Five Live. Um, Peter, you, you, you're, you're in Decentraland. What are you doing there? How many hours do you spend there and what are you up to? Um, well, I've been sort of involved in the project since about February, really, as a, a sort of an end user. And I started doing the research, really like the idea of the virtual city, um, so I started buying land, which you can buy on the marketplace. And then I sort of evaluate the plots and then I resell the land. So at the moment, I'm sort of trading land, building up my portfolio and also in the background using the software tools to start developing content for my land. And what do you aim to do with all that land? Who do you want to use it? Or are you going to put, I mean, James is going for his university. Have you got a grand dream? Um, I've got a few ideas, but really I'm starting to build up my portfolio of land, which I could then rent to people because rental is going to be an option. Um, I can start developing it, maybe using a professional third party company to develop stuff for me. So I might want to put my shop uh, in the city or I've got a few sort of um, gaming ideas that I might want to implement. So the more land you have, obviously, the more you can develop and the more ideas you can implement. But of course, it's not just about how much land. It's all about location, location, location. Are you, where's, right. where's the best place to be in Decentraland? Well, it's hard to say at the moment, although a lot of people say on roads, because a lot of people who visit the city will start browsing and naturally probably tend to use the roads to browse the content. So on the sort of there's minor and major roads around the plazas, which are going to be spawn points for people, to, new people who join the game, so there are certain areas of the map that are considered more prestigious than others, and my idea is to have as much land spread across the map as I can uh, accumulate over the next few months before we go live. Uh, Peter, it's an interesting experiment. Thank you very much indeed, Peter in Bath. Thanks to James Ashton, thanks to David Gerrard, thanks to Jonathan Griffin as well from BBC Trending. Uh, it, be, it remains to be seen if that plot line in Ready Player One plays out, that we all find virtual reality are far better than our normal lives. Uh, anyway, we'll be back tomorrow. It's Five Live Sport. Now Kelly Cates with a special guest, Owen Coyle.